Hello, Mr. Wheeler here, and today we are learning about photosynthesis. This is the site of photosynthesis. This is called a chloroplast. Chloroplasts are specific plastids within cells. They function as organelles, and this special type of plastid is responsible for being the site of photosynthesis. Looking at this chloroplast, you will first notice that it is green. Plastids, or chloroplasts in particular, are green because they have a pigment called chlorophyll. Chlorophyll absorbs high energy light and uh, it reflects lower energy light or unwanted light in this case. The green and the yellows would be reflected and the higher energies, the blues, the indigos and the violets and even sometimes the low energy reds are going to be absorbed by the chloroplasts to power photosynthesis. And so within a chloroplast, you can see that there are stacks of thylakoids, is what they're called. And one stack of thylakoids is called a granum. If you have multiple granum, then it's called grana. Grana being the plural term for granum. Uh, all of the grana are attached in a intricate arrangement, and they are surrounded by an aqueous water-like fluid called the stroma. Here is a diagram representing a chloroplast. So you see the double membrane of the chloroplast. And this diagram is split into two components representing each phase of photosynthesis. The first phase is the light dependent reactions, which occurs in the thylakoid membrane and on the inside of the thylakoid called the thylakoid lumen. And then the second phase of photosynthesis called the Calvin cycle, sometimes referred to as the Calvin Benson cycle, uh, occurs in the stroma of the chloroplasts, not in the thylakoid. So, starting with the first half of photosynthesis, the light-dependent reactions, these are called the light-dependent reactions because they need sunlight to occur. And so, what happens is the sunlight strikes the photosystems, which are specialized proteins that are embedded within the thylakoid membrane, and when the um, sunlight strikes those proteins, which have chlorophyll in them, the chlorophyll uh, is going to transfer electrons from water through an intricate system, a pathway of proteins, and ultimately it's going to end up linking a hydrogen ion to NADP plus to create NADPH, which functions as an electron carrier. And so we see the sunlight hitting in the photosystems over here. This is photosystem 2, and this is photosystem 1. So the electrons start uh, in photosystem 2. The reason why they start in photosystem 2, photosystem 2 is called photosystem 2 simply because it was discovered second after photosystem 1. And so at photosystem 2, we have a water molecule being split into oxygen, which is the same thing as half of a molecular oxygen molecule, and then two hydrogen ions. So pretty much we're ripping the electrons uh, out of the bonds of water, and we are transferring them through this protein system. You can kind of think of it like electricity powering these proteins. So what's left behind after water is split is the oxygen, which is going to be a byproduct, and then you have hydrogen ions. Uh, because hydrogen ions are being generated in one location, the concentration is high, and so we have a natural tendency for the hydrogen ions to diffuse through the thylakoid lumen until they come across the ATP synthase protein. ATP synthase uh, undergoes chemiosmosis, and the hydrogen ions will zip right through that protein, and they will uh, regenerate ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. So the adenosine diphosphate gains another phosphate and becomes adenosine triphosphate. This is used in the next part of photosynthesis. Up top, going back to the splitting of water, that electron zips through photosystem 2, uh, some other proteins, photosystem 1, and then eventually it allows the hydrogen ion to be linked to NADP plus to create NADPH. So the two products of the first phase of photosynthesis, the light-dependent reactions, are NADPH as well as ATP. Moving on to the Calvin cycle, ATP is used as well as NADPH to ultimately convert CO2 and link them together to form this G3P molecule, which can then be built into sugar. This is the Calvin cycle. 
This again occurs in the stroma of the chloroplasts. And so at the very top, we have three molecules of carbon dioxide coming in, and they're going to be reacting with a five carbon molecule called uh, rub P. And so we have these five carbon molecules. We have three of them, and we are bonding these three carbon dioxides. When we bond these carbon dioxides, we create these six carbon chains, which are extremely unstable, and they immediately decompose to these three PGA molecules, of which we have six. And so we're bonding the CO2s, we are creating an unstable intermediate, and then we're creating six of these three PGA molecules. This is stage one of the Calvin cycle, and it is called carbon fixation. The next phase is called, or the next stage is called reduction. So we take these six three PGA molecules and we use energy uh, from ATP that was generated in the light dependent reactions. So the ATP is depleted to ADP. And in the process, these PGA molecules, three PGA molecules, are being reduced to uh, another molecule, a higher energy molecule called GA3P, of which we also have six of those molecules. So down here, we have those six molecules. And so at this point, one of those GA3P molecules will be stored, and then the remaining five get reconverted to the original five carbon chains, and then the cycle goes through uh, once more to create another uh, GA3P. And once we have two of those GA3Ps, we could start creating carbohydrates like glucose, fructose, or even uh, longer polysaccharides like starch. So the Calvin cycle will be able to only fix one carbon dioxide at a time, and so it will actually have to go through six times for an entire glucose molecule or three times for one GA3P molecule. So we're taking the carbon dioxide, we're fixing it to the five carbon chain, creating an unstable six carbon chain that breaks into six 3PGA molecules. Those get reduced to the higher power GA3P molecules, one of which is used later to produce glucose. The remaining five get recycled through to back to the beginning of the cycle. And so, in summary, this is the chloroplast. We have the light-dependent reactions, and then we have the Calvin cycle. The light-dependent reactions happen on the thylakoid membrane, which is uh, part of a granum. The water comes in, is split. We get oxygen as a byproduct. The electron from the water is used to uh, take an NADP plus and bond a hydrogen to it to create NADPH, and then the ATP is recharged, if you will, with the hydrogen ion as we take ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and we make an inorganic phosphate to create ATP. ATP and ADPH, energy molecule and electron carrier, are both used to help create uh, GA3P, which is synthesized from carbon dioxide, five of which get recycled through, one of them gets used to create glucose. There are other alternative pathways for photosynthesis. For example, these cacti, they uh, exist in very arid environments where the air is very dry. And so they don't want to have their stomata open during the daytime because they'll just get dried out because the water will leave. And so they have an alternative pathway. These ones, or the cacti, uh, as an example, are what we call cam plants. And what cam plants do is they'll actually store their CO2 in their leaves at night and they'll close their stomata during the day and undergo photosynthesis with the stored CO2. That way, the water will not leave uh, the cells and um, they will not be dried out. So this minimizes water loss. Some examples of plants that are considered cam plants and undergo this alternative photosynthesis pathway are cacti, orchids, and pineapple plants. A normal photosynthesis path pathway is a C3 pathway because the carbon is stored into GA3P, a three carbon compound. There are also um, more efficient uh, photosynthesis plants, photosynthetic plants called C4 plants. Instead of forming a three carbon compound, they'll form a four carbon compound. And the reason why they'll do this is because the enzyme responsible for fixing the carbon uh, at high temperatures, it becomes inefficient because it starts to fix oxygen instead of carbon. 
And so to prevent that, uh, these plants have evolved to uh, prevent that by forming a four carbon compound instead through a different process. And uh, therefore these plants are especially adapted to higher temperatures and they're actually more efficient than three carbon compound creating plants, C3 plants. So some examples, some primary examples of C4 plants are corn and sugarcane. So here's a table that um, shows the differences between C3, C4 plants, as well as CAM plants. We can see they differ in their leaf structure. Uh, notably, C4 plants have chloroplasts in their bundle sheaths, which is uh, the, the vascular bundle is the part of the plant that allows it to be rigid and grow upright. And then the sheath is the group of cells that surrounds that. And so most plants, C3 plants, do not have chloroplasts in that part of the the plant and C4 plants do. Also, um, CAM plants have very large vacuoles for storing lots of water uh, in their mesophyll cells because remember they're going to be storing all of that CO2 at night and so they need water during the day to undergo uh, photosynthesis. So CAM plants they capture at night, undergo photosynthesis and create the glucose during the day. Um, C3 plants they are your normal typical plants they uh, require moist habitats. They have optimum temperature ranges of 15 to 25 degrees Celsius. Whereas the C4 plants, they're ineffective in the shade. They require arid or tropical regions. They're adapted to high temperatures. And so we see that their optimum uh, temperature range is 30 to 40. And we actually find that their productivity is very high because they're specially adapted. Uh, and we believe that the form of photosynthesis that's occurring in C4 plants is actually more sophisticated than C3 plants and that it was uh, adapted uh, much later. So that's it for photosynthesis and I will see you next time.